who are just joining us. Uh, I'm Vanessa Avery. I'm the executive director of Sharing Sacred Spaces, and we've organized the summit for you. Uh, we're a secular nonprofit whose mission is to overcome bias, misunderstanding, and hate and heal division through intergroup encounter and education. And to do so, we often begin with the built environment, particularly sacred architecture and notions of sacred space in order to engage with and process differing worldviews. So we work in several cities uh, across North America. And belonging is a question and motivation that runs through all of our work. This week, we have a special lineup that includes three incredible architects who capture and express a worldview of belonging, unity, and interconnect interconnectedness in the built space. And it's such a fascinating way to look at architecture. And with that in mind, it is my absolute delight and honor to announce today's special, special guest, Rachel Grotowski. She's founder and principal of RHG Architecture and Design. Rachel is an award-winning architect, designer, thought leader, and keynote speaker who is leading the conversation of designing what truly matters. She believes that design surpasses simply being beautiful, that design has the power to inspire a sense of calm, interconnectedness, presence, and gratitude, leading to the belief that design is spiritual. Rachel, welcome, and it's so great to have you here with me today. Thank you, Vanessa. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I can't wait to, to get started. Absolutely. Um, so, so the organization that that is running the summit, Sharing Sacred Spaces, we were actually founded by an architect. And um, and so we've looked a lot at this idea. I think our one of our foundational ideas is how space communicates a story and also facilitates our interactions. Um, and we always strive to understand more about how space does this. And I never honestly myself considered architecture or the power of architecture to influence us in these ways and to tell these stories. So when I learned about your philosophy of design and your practice, I was really very eager to talk with you. And uh, just before we take the deep dive into, into all that, I just wanted to ask you a, a couple of questions about yourself and your own history. Um, how did you come to be an architect? And was architecture something that you knew you wanted to do when when you were younger? Such a good question because, you know, so many other architects that I know knew early on that that's what they wanted to do. I guess small children, they, they just knew that was their path and that was not me. Um, I didn't really have... I didn't come from a background that I actually even understood that architecture was even a thing, quite frankly. Um, and it wasn't until I traveled to Europe that I really started to see the buildings and the structures for really this uh, magnificent expression of humanity and, and you know, the history that was... Uh, not just in the design details, but in the stories and the memories that resided within the walls uh, of the buildings. And so I got really interested and curious about architectural history and preservation before I actually came to the idea that architecture, I, I could actually be part of that. Like I could actually be creating spaces that could hold these memories, hold these moments, uh, both joyful and sad and bring people together. And uh, that's how I got here. That's fascinating. You know, I've I've heard other architects talk about these experiences in Europe also as as really the opening to to seeing architecture as a possibility. And I have to admit when I went to Europe too, it was it was very impactful. And um, uh, that that longer sense of history, I guess, that's involved in that. Um, what about spirituality? Uh, I'm curious, and if you don't mind my asking, were you raised with a particular worldview, and and has that evolved over time? 
So I was not I was not really raised with a particular worldview. My both sets of my grandparents uh, were Catholic, and but my parents were not active at all. Um, and so on the weekends when I would be with them, we would go uh, we would go to church, and of course I would hear. Uh, the words and the feelings of, of the community, uh, the, the, the sense of togetherness. Um, but because it was only like intermittent, it, I really didn't know that much about it. I didn't really understand. Um, but what I did understand was that there was something bigger. And I recall coming home from my grandparents one weekend and saying to my mother, um, I really, I, I, I need to do that more. I need to do that more. Um, and of course, I don't know how old I was at that time, maybe like seven or something. And, you know, certainly my parents weren't necessarily going to change what, what their belief system was or what their actions were in that, in, at that moment. Um, as I got older, maybe in high school, I started studying many different religions so uh, and philosophies from uh, the Kabbalah to Taoism and Zen, Buddhism, Hinduism. I kind of just was surveying um, all of these different belief structures uh, because I was searching for this guiding light, this um, like this this, something that acknowledged what I could feel that that in whether you're in nature or the built environment um, that that we when you connect to your own body you can feel like the energy that is outside of you know just uh, what you can see I guess so over the time, I, I, I really dove into all these different philosophies and where does that land me now? I think my belief system now is, is really a blending of all of that. And I continue to learn and research and uh, uh, find commonalities amongst different cultures and belief systems and religions uh, to really stay I think grounded and and in my own truth. Thank you. I I didn't know that you studied religion initially, and I find that well resonating since I did too. <laughs> and of course, architecture is uh, and religion go so beautifully together. Um, um, and and I want to get into uh, this idea of you know, at what point did architecture and spirituality intersect for you? You know, I actually think it always did. Um, I might not have had the language behind it, but when I think back to, when I, when I think back to architecture school and I think back to my thesis project and how I, you know, my thesis project was uh, a wellness retreat center and, and the way in which I designed that project, and of course I designed many school projects at that point already, but that project was about the moments in time that I remembered and made me feel something. So for example, um, when I was in elementary school, I was in Colorado in a very pro progressive public school where we had like, this pit in the middle of the, of the classrooms. And that was where we would all go when we had more uh, intimate conversations or or difficult conversations. Um, it set the stage because you step down into the space where you could be more authentic. Um, so that stuck, and that was something I integrated into the design. This idea that you know we are part of nature. 
um, was something that I brought into the project through, um, because of course, not only were we developing architecture, but we were developing an entire program. So we had communal gardening and then communal cooking and then, uh, you know, story time. And there were all of these both physical and experiential pieces that I brought to, to the project. And, and so when I look back, I think I, at that point in time, I already knew that design would be a spiritual. Um, but I don't think that I actually, and, and actually, if I look back to my, my bookshelf from those days, uh, I actually did have books that were about like the Taoism of architecture or uh, spiritual design. And I, and I kind of forgot that over time. You know, I, I was in that moment, and I think when you go out into the world and start practicing architecture, it becomes, you know, you're learning, right? So at that point, it became very tectonic. It became about perfectionism. It became about functionality. And it became very much less about the feeling that that architecture was creating it was an aesthetic um and only only over the last maybe 10 years did i come back to the memory that uh you know honestly like why am i practicing architecture if I'm just creating something beautiful. Like I really want to change people's lives. I want to provide an opportunity for them to uh, be centered, to, to be uh, well, to affect the environment in a positive way. And when I start looking at where I, I wanted to be, how I wanted to be practicing, and then what I knew from the past, I started to remember that design is a spiritual practice. I started breaking down the history of architecture and thinking about, you know, the premise of architecture is really protection, right? And then once we grew past that, architecture was about getting closer to God, whatever that means to you, whether that's nature or Allah or, you know, a... Uh, uh, you know, a cathedral, it could be, it can be, whatever that means for you is about getting closer to uh, this, this, this big power um, that actually could also be yourself. So uh, that's really when I started coming down. I think I had written this, this uh, statement for another speaking event that I had done that I think kind of is, is fairly succinct. And I had said, uh, design is the physical representation of the interconnectedness of humanity and our connection with the natural world. When we understand this truth, we realize our place, our purpose, and our value. Our work changes the world, design is spiritual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. And it's so interesting too, you talked about architecture as starting out as protection. And if I if I could make a really vast generalization here, we have, you know, homes for protection or whatever kinds of structures we have for protection, but we probably also had uh worship areas temples or altars or things like that um um and it seems as if for me even the protection of our homes we want to be more spiritual because they've evolved it, it occurs to me they've evolved over time um and i haven't looked into the exact history of that but i find that you're your statement about architecture initially being for that particular purpose and how we've kind of come through history is fascinating. Um, and how these, these do intersect the built environment and the spirituality really intersect more and more for us, I think, these days. Um, we're on the second week of talking about belonging in the summit, and we ended last week with as as you're talking about now too, this more expansive view 
of belonging as inclusive of not just humanity, but also including nature, including the larger ecosystem and inter interdependence. And we also talked about a sense of belonging, if you will, that can undo our alienation and counteract to some degree, you know, living behind closed doors or in a cubicle or in our cars or, or whatever it may be. As And as an architect, I wonder what would you say are the most effective design techniques for designing a structure that fosters belonging instead of isolation or alienation? Um, you know, how can the built environment help us to connect to one another as well as to nature? I mean, I believe that when we're designing spaces, part of the practice is figuring out what's important, right? So there's a lot of different aesthetic styles of design. Um, for me, I find that when you when you're looking at a space and you're looking at number one like the way we move through space um when we can move through space with ease we're able to be uh, our nervous system calms right so when our nervous system's calm we're able to connect but when our nervous system is activated it makes it much more difficult for us to really be present and be in conversation or open to uh, open to 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 others, um, and also even to connect with ourselves. So, easeful organization, easeful movement through space. Um, yes, absolutely. The integration of nature into our environments. What does that mean through materiality like, you know, wood and stone? Um, because, you know, science does say that that nature does, again, it calms our nerve system. It lowers our heart rate. Uh, also, um, things, things like um, spaces that we can uh, both be together and alone, right? So... You know, oftentimes it's, it's about creating this quiet, this calm, so that we can, um, so we can be open. And, and I find that like when we, when we're present and open, then we, we step into a moment of gratitude and awe, and it just changes our entire experience. Ultimately, that's, that's the goal that I'm, that I'm always focused on. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say about materiality is just going back to natural materials is I think there's something about truth um, that we all forget. We move at such a fast pace in, in our current world that we are not often thinking about, is this real? Is this true? And when we, so when we use materials that aren't honest, there is this little piece of us that spends this energy questioning, you know, is that real wood? Is that real stone? And it disrupts our entire thought process, our entire system to a point that, um, that we can't really articulate it, right? Like we don't really know, but I think there's something inherent about our our bodies as nervous systems, as energy that picks up on all of these incongruencies and um, makes it harder for us to connect to each other and, and to ourselves. And so I really uh, want to focus on, on those details in, in design projects. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah, the use of, of honest. I love how you said the word honest materials and truth in the design. Uh, you also mentioned the need for, and this I think relates to this understanding of belonging we've been talking about too, is the need for spaces for people to interact, but also spaces for people to be alone. Um, could you say a little bit more about that? I, I, I think of, I think of um, 
office spaces. Um, I think of, you know, homes, I think are more conducive, but uh, but this idea I think is so interesting. We we did talk a bit last week about people belonging in different ways um, and kind of the need to acknowledge and and relate to them in the way that they want to belong. And I, from a design sense, I think it's fascinating that you are bringing the, that up, these two different kinds of spaces. I mean, first I want to say that where we belong, the first place we belong is to ourselves, right? So that's why I think it's important to have spaces that we can be both together and alone. And I think, you know, in office spaces, you know, uh, we can create quiet rooms. Like just as an example, in our office, we actually have a, I call it the meditation room, uh, some people go uh, take a nap, some people go just to have a private phone call, and some people actually meditate. Um, you know, in, in our homes, we can have altar spaces, we can have reading rooms, nooks. Uh, again, it's, it's this space that we can allow things to slow and actually ask the question, how do I feel? You know, why am I, you know, agitated? Why am I tired? Why do I feel tense? Because we actually don't even slow down enough to 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 notice how we're feeling in our body. Um, and 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 then when we're together, you know, we need to again be able to have a safe space where we can be authentic. Uh, we need to. We need to have these getting opportunities to be in smaller groups and larger groups. I think about in the home, I ask people a lot of questions when we're designing. So if it's a if it's a house, how does your family operate? First, who is in your family? Who do you consider to be, you know, on a day-to-day -day, uh interaction with each other? Does your family like to for example, when they're when they're together, is it playing a game? Is it doing a puzzle? Or is it that you're all in one space doing your own activities, but that feels like being together? That is a sense of belonging in in one family, whereas another family, it's going to be that game night or you know doing a puzzle. So a lot of it is asking questions. And when you're talking about a larger community, it's providing different types of spaces so that again, as you pointed out, like there is a different type of belonging for uh, di different individuals have different needs. So it might be uh, the the banquet that has a, has a rounded shape at the dinner table uh, or at the restaurant, and then another person might want like a, a table out in the middle of the room because somehow the action, the energy makes them feel like a part of something bigger. So it's asking the questions of who the user is and how they need to be supported. Yeah, oh, that's great, that's great. Um, is there a space that you've designed, a space of belonging that you're particularly proud of? You know, a lot of the spaces that I'm most proud of are uh, for different organizations that, that are providing community involvement. And I think it's because you because it's so active, it's so obvious to see that people feel a sense of belonging. And obviously part of it is the program uh, that they're that uh, is being provided. So as an example, I've done a couple of projects with Montclair Film which is a film festival and an education center. Uh, and it, the, the, I did done two projects with them that were designed with this focus of creating a sense of community and uh, around cinema. And, you know, the way I see people using the education center, which also has a micro theater in it, brings me so much joy because you know, there are teams that come together uh, and find their people. Uh, they have programs for individuals who are, uh, they, they need like reduced sound for their, their sensitive, I don't know what they call it, 
I don't know what they call it, but it's reduced sound, like quieter cinema uh, events. They also have like a new parents movie program. And so it's creating a space that feels intimate and comfortable where somebody can bring their baby and watch the movie and uh, feel like they can, you know, step out, change a diaper, come back in in the middle of the movie. So it's it's really creating spaces uh, that people can can really be themselves. And Montclair Film is one of those projects that I'm really proud of uh, because it's, it has done that both in the architecture, design, the finishes. Um, and it also represents, you know, projects like this, like the 505 Cinema 505 at Mount Clare Film and the Claridge, they, they uh, also are a representation of our community through the artisans that we've chosen, um, the decor being built by local uh, mill workers and upholsterers, and sort of just bringing community together to build the project as much as design and use. Mm, that sounds fantastic. I I would go to a theater space like that. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Um, really, really wonderful. Um, do you see a trajectory to your work? Uh, is there something in particular that you aspire to design that you haven't had a chance to do yet? Yeah, I mean, I really want to go back and 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 build a or design another wellness retreat center. You know, it's kind of funny that that was my graduate school thesis because I find myself getting closer and closer to wanting to create that in real life. And I, I think part of it is that, you know, at this point in my career, I think about what do I really want? Like, what what are the what are the spaces and places that I want to be in? And those are the spaces I want to create. It's like supporting my own wellness and hopefully the wellness of many others. Um, and so that's really a dream. And, you know, I feel like it's it will happen. Um, we've done lots of spas and uh, lots of, you know, yoga studios and uh, wellness centers that are but it's like that whole thing where somebody's going out in nature with, with buildings that are really built from and through the land um, that really are going to give people a moment to uh, be with themselves and with their community. Mm. I hope you get to build that. Um, <laughs> is there, well, I'll shift to a, a very practical question now which is if there was one thing that the people here could do within their own environment to create a greater sense of interconnectedness and belonging what would you advise them to do say three steps instead of one thing mm -hmm. um the first to me is you know let go of what you no longer need so it's really like reducing what you have in your environment uh the second is the the reverence the 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 stories of what you choose to keep and really kind of remembering why are these things important you know why why do i have this vase why do i have uh you know who made this sofa you know, choosing things in your environment that uh, have meaning. And then I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's honoring the history of the structures and, uh, and our own stories, our, our lineage, um, because usually oftentimes in our environments we actually do have stories you know whether it's the piece of art on the wall or it's the it is the the vase that you that you collected or inherited these are stories of our lives that remind us that the spaces that we're in 
uh, are holding us and they are protecting us, but they're also giving us uh, an opportunity for inspiration and connectedness, uh, not just with with our you know with ourselves and with our community and with the past. Yeah, three great three great suggestions. Thank you. I want to um, give the people here a chance to ask their questions to you as well, Rachel. Um, so I'll turn to you now, and there are two ways to ask a question. You can raise your Zoom hand, and we welcome you to ask them uh, live. Or you can write a question in the chat if that's more comfortable for you. Uh, either way works for us. And, um, let's see, other questions? Talitha, good morning. Good morning. I think uh, Ms. Morgan had her hand up before I did, Suzanne. Oh. I'm going to let Suzanne. her go ahead and go first. Sorry, Suzanne, I didn't see your hand up. Well, welcome, Suzanne Morgan our, is our founder, and uh, I'm delighted to see you this morning. You're on mute, though, Suzanne. Can you unmute yourself? Hello? That's great. Okay. So, Rachel, what, what great thoughts and things. I would love to see some actual work. Maybe I'd like to go and see one. Where where do you have something that's closest to Hudson, Ohio? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great question. Uh, you'd have to come to New Jersey or right now, actually, we're working on some projects in Green Bay, Wisconsin. That might be a little bit closer when they get built, but uh, we're we're actually working on uh, an urban farm project in in Green Bay, which is going to be a community center. I'm really excited about it because it's it's a project that is part of a planned community for first generation uh, families, and this space will be for education as well as uh, community events. And yeah, so that that's probably going to be closer than than New Jersey, but I don't know. That's right. Uh, so um, could I come and see you there? And, and uh, how far along are these projects? So those are projects they... are going to be, that project's expected to go into construction in January or February, depending. Obviously, there's a little bit of weather to, to account for in Green Bay. We, um, we also have a public market that's going to be built in Green Bay. Um, it happens to be an existing building, so that one probably really will go into construction in January, February. Interesting. Well, um, I go to Chicago a lot, and I also have a, a 45 unit apartment building in Kenosha, Wisconsin. That I've owned fantastic. In a long time. It was uh, designed by my grandfather, who was an architect. Um, I love that. I actually started my career in Chicago, so um, you know I did. I worked there for about eight years before I made it to the East Coast. Okay, where where were you in Chicago? Um, I worked for a firm called Brendan Reister, and then I also uh, midnight uh, or moonlight moonlighted for Jordan Mosier, who was doing restaurants and and. Uh, hotels at the time. Interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, for great questions. And I hope you two get to connect in Wisconsin. That'd be fabulous. Um, Talitha, did you have a question? Yeah, the first part of my question got answered. I was asked, I wanted to know locations as well. So that was great. Um, the second part of my question, um, I do a lot of centering my folks in um, holistic care. What do you when you're talking about storytelling and the environments that they're in creating those comfortable community environments? I want to go to the other side with how do you deconstruct those environments that are not telling good stories that don't have those environments that are inviting? How do you um, ground people in how to tr transmute from one type of space into another? You know, I think. 
it, it's actually a great question. Um, I was just in a project uh, over last Friday that I walked in and it felt very dysregulated is the way I would describe it. Um, it felt very chaotic and the way and and I spent you know actually it was for a photo shoot and so I I kind of stopped paused and kind of waited to see how the energy was moving in the space I mean some of it is I always think of it as a little bit like alchemy you know it's about shifting the energy of the space so that people feel uh safe and a lot of times that's taking things out and mindfully putting things back so you remove it and then you figure out what you know whether it's texture you know where you can place the item the thing you know again this is with an existing space right so usually the things that you're layering back in are very easy to understand. So, you know, again, now I'm talking about design versus, you know, interiors versus architecture, but, you know, maybe it's that there has to be something soft, right? Or maybe the piece of art on the wall needs to have this um, expansiveness so that the individuals who are coming into the space see beyond, right? Um, it's really an, a, a, a removal and then a mindful adding back. Thank you so much. Uh, for, Thank you. Yeah. Kristen. Hi, Kristen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Rachel. It, it, this is wonderful. So I thank you. Um, so I heard you speak of doing wellness centers that have an indoor outdoor piece. The type of work that I'm involved in is more of um, loss, legacy, uh, memorial type of spaces or ritual type of spaces. But what I'm really looking to do is to do something outdoors that's predominantly outdoors with just minimal architectural spaces that are those built environments. My question is, I know you've done both where you've got the combination of the outdoor and the indoor, but have you ever done anything that is predominantly outdoors with maybe art as the architectural spaces or um, built structures that work that way? And if you have, if you have not, would it be something you would be interested in thinking about in the future of doing something that is less uh, built indoor? structures and something that might be considered for more of just designing an outdoor space? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what I immediately think about is having built uh, outdoor altars. And actually, I even think about if I go all the way back in time, I think it makes me think of even as a small child, like finding these spaces in the outdoor environment where I could create something like with the sticks, with the you know, stones. Um, so I know what you're talking about. Uh, I actually personally have created a platform. I have a cottage in, in uh, upstate New York. And the first thing I did was I built a platform above the house so I could see the expansiveness of nature and come into ritual in that space. Right. Because ultimately, again, I'm always looking to quiet, uh, to quiet my surroundings so that I can kind of come back to myself and then create these ritual moments with 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 myself and others uh the platforms like built so that i can i can bring others there as well uh that i have brought other people there so I, i've done that for myself i have not done that 
outdoor ritual space for others, or meaning like with organizations or as clients. Um, but I do understand the need and the importance. And I think just speaking of the of the the process or purpose of ritual, I find that this is one of the things that we are most missing. Um, not growing up in a household that was particularly, um, you know, thoughtful behind the rituals that we that we had, I, I kind of didn't realize that that culture was originally that we were so ritualistic at one point in time. It wasn't it just was not a word that was part of my uh, my life. And I now feel that if we could step through life understanding that most experiences can have the possibility of having ritual, we would be, I think, much more connected and happy, uh, joyful. And um, I, I really would like to help shift the narrative about how we live our lives and creating spaces, whether it's outdoor or indoor, where that can happen is, is quite meaningful. Thank you. I, I I believe I shared a similar upbringing where you crawl under a tree and that would be your ritual space for the day and it just felt very personal and private. So again, would you ever consider the potential of, I have a space in mind, it is a former shrine that is acres. I live in northern Vermont after moving from the concrete jungle and uh, um, it is so very different and there is a former shrine that has all of these architectural elements to it that i just have this vision of creating this memorial space where it could be all of these different elements combined but it really is so far outside of the scope of what i do it would have to be designed by someone who isn't necessarily a landscape designer because that's not really it really is an architecturally designed space so is there such a thing is it something that you would is it something that someone who does what you do which sounds exactly like what it would be would be willing to consider at some point again i'm not asking you for today but just something for a potential opportunity down the road is that something that someone with your abilities would be willing to consider absolutely i mean i think that sounds incredibly exciting and meaningful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I appreciate that because it really, it is this amazing space and I keep looking at it and I think, but this is not a landscape design space. This is a, this is completely, it's, it's a ritual space, but you need someone who understands that ritual aspect of, of everything you do. So I thank you for that. I appreciate your openness and willingness to, and your platform sounds amazing. We have an A-frame and we're contemplating a whole wrap around the top because it gives you that vantage point that is so different and makes you feel so big and so small all at the same time. Exactly. You know, so I, thank you. And I hope you put your name in for the raffle, which we'll <laughs> announce in about five minutes. <laughs> thank you. Please, please do, yeah. Um, the project sooner than what I anticipate. So, you know, that's always a little fear. It creates a little fearful, <laughs> energetic, you know, excitement, but you know, but yeah, so thank you. I should, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Rachel, we have another question in the chat, so I'll read that one for everyone. It says, thank you, Rachel, for this insightful talk. I'm always wondering if architecture movements, such as minimalism, rationalism, and brutalism, which although they reduce the space to its bare minimum for a spiritual focus, does not fully speak to what you mentioned as warm materials, textures, colors, etc. So for those following these bear movements, do they have a different sense of belonging that an architecture might that is more cultural and local? Great question. I mean, I think I think that depends, right? Like It's a point in time where I moved towards that sort of 
pretty strictly towards minimalism and almost brutalism. And I do see that by stripping away, there is often the opportunity, and maybe it just, I think it probably depends on your cultural background, but, uh, and, and that it did does provide this opportunity um, for spiritual connection because you, you, there's no noise, right? But at the same time, I mean, I was, I was in in India, I don't know, maybe like five years ago. And quite honestly, the number of times that I just started crying, um, without any real understanding of why it was remarkable, right? Like I was in these, these places that some people call like you know, thin places, right? That that have this inherent energy, right? So if you can create that through minimal through minimalist spaces and uh, the use of energy, and you can create that in a you know more cultural uh, in aesthetic that might be a shrine or it might be uh frankly a cave a meditation cave you know so i i don't think that i don't think that the architecture can take that away i think it's a combination i think um i believe it's a combination of of the shit, the, 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 uh, how do I want to say the organization of the energy, um, the intent, uh, the, when I say intent, I mean like the design intent, but there's also an objective, which is different than intent. Right. Um, and then it's the, it's, it's the people who are there. It's also what happens over time. So, you know, if you have a minimalist or brutalist structure that people are meditating or praying in or uh, coming together in ritual, that's going to be different than one that uh, I guess I think about maybe a work environment. It's maybe not so it, it, you're not infusing it in the same way. So, yeah, I don't know. So it's a that's a tricky question. I got to think about that a little bit more. But I do think that that generally speaking, these these thin places, thin yeah, thin places can happen whether it's a architectural style or aesthetic, as well as if it has a cultural representation of history and past. Both have a lot of energy behind them. Uh, they're just different. Fabulous, yeah, uh, really interesting. Um really interesting questions and thank you for incredible responses. Are there any more questions? I will check. We could probably take one more if there are any out there. Okay. We try and so people who are at work can get to their 11 o'clock. <laughs> so I will uh, move into the next portion and um, announce the exciting gift that Rachel's offering to those who are here in the room today. Uh, we'll run it raffle style. If you've been here before, you're familiar with the process. So Rachel's giving away five free consultations. Uh, do you want to say anything about the consultation, Rachel? Um, um, just that's an invitation to talk about uh, the you know, a project you might have or a thought, even a thought that you might have that you want to further discuss um, or guidance on on the, a program that that maybe you're, you're considering. Um, I'm pretty open to what that looks like, um, but I look forward to whoever whoever gets these and, and hearing what you're up to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, so it's this is a great opportunity to have a consultation or conversation with Rachel and we're giving away five. So 
what you'll do, and Fazde will put our email address in the chat for you. Uh, you'll write to summit at sharingsacredspaces.org, and I ask you to please, in the subject line of your email, write the word spiritual. And that will all be in. I can't see my the chat box, but I trust Fazde is already putting it in summit at sharingsacredspaces.org and in the subject line of the email put spiritual. We'll announce the winners uh, tomorrow morning at our next interview. And if you're not here, if you can't be here, no worries. We will email you if you've won. So coming up tomorrow, same bat time, same bat Zoom link <laughs> for those of you who used to watch uh, those great shows growing up, Batman. Um, we have architect Hank Hauser. He's a founding partner with Hauser Walker Architecture, and that's in Atlanta. Hauser Walker Architecture uh, won AIA Atlanta's 2017 Firm of the Year and Georgia's 2021 Firm of the Year for design leadership. And Hank's individual work has won several design excellence awards from the AIA Urban Land Institute Faith and Form, what Institute, the Georgia Trust for Preservation and Engineering News Network. So his core belief is the essence of great architecture is the integration of multiple complex inputs into a holistic, cohesive, and beautiful resolution. So we're gonna talk tomorrow with Hank, and I hope that you'll join us for that conversation as well. Rachel, thank you for your beautiful spiritual work your integrative work, and for being here with us today. Um, it's really a pleasure to talk to you more about your design as spiritual. And uh, do you want to say, I see you want to say something. I just wanted to say thank you for the invitation and uh, to be a part of it. It's, it's an honor to, to participate. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute boon for us today and a gift. Um, I wish everyone here a peaceful and rejuvenating rest of the day. I hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you for tuning in and bringing your attention to us. And if you'd like to take yourselves off mute and say goodbye, we're happy to hear your voices. Thank you so much, Rachel. Bye, Rachel. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.